Hello from the ABC Music Talk podcast, the show for anyone interested in the music industry. Today we return to the disciplines category to talk to two individuals who are very much just in the beginning stages of their career, yet have very quickly started to find their feet. But before that, I need to remind you to go row to your videos. Rota is for artists, managers, labels, or anyone in the music industry who needs to create video content for promotion or monetization. Rota makes it fast, easy, and inexpensive to do all of that in one place. Head to www.abcmusic.co and click the Rota logo on the homepage to access a 10% off discount for the service. Welcome to the show, Nell Jones and Ethan Udell. Thank, thank you for you. having us, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, well, no, and thank you. So, listeners, we're doing this is another one of those ones we're doing over the phone. Not a COVID nineteen related reason, but um, these guys are not in England. Uh, where, in fact, whereabouts are you? Yeah, so we're actually in New York right now. Um, just finished up school, both of us, and uh, yeah, based out of New York, I'm, I'm on Long Island and. Nelson yeah, city. I'm a, been in New York City where it's very quarantined. And yeah, so I'm a, I I I kind of imagine it like some sort of dystopian sort of nightmare in New York at the moment. <laughs> is it is that fairly accurate? It's definitely opening up a little. It's actually nice because now every restaurant and bar has outdoor tables, which weren't really there before. So it's definitely nice walking around the streets and seeing everyone out. It's getting it's becoming more lively for sure. So some level of normality returning, yeah. which is uh, which is great to hear. That's awesome. All right, so regular listeners to the show know that I normally ask my guests to tell me about their extensive career and the reason why they've got to where they've got to. But this uh, this episode is absolutely about two two people in their sort of early stages of their career, and therefore the actual show is about that that story. So um, so instead of that, we're just going to sort of go go straight into it. You've both come from a uh, sort of a, a point of a base of experience from a label called Small Town Records. Ethan, I was wondering if you could just sort of just briefly explain kind of a little bit more about that because there's something slightly unique to, to that label. Yeah, absolutely. So so Nell and I met uh, attending Duke University in North Carolina in the US. Um, and Duke, you know, I think both of us probably didn't realize before we got there, but they have a very comprehensive, uh, sophisticated student-run record label that's well funded by the university. Um, they have a full studio space on campus, um, different you know re- recording rooms, rehearsal rooms, meeting rooms, whatever it might be. We had about ten artists on the label uh, at our max, um, and you know sixty plus students working with us, and with the yearly audition process as students you know finished up university and left school. And the whole goal of it really was to kind of be a, a foundation for artists' careers in the music industry. Uh, you know, when those artists are students at the same time, uh, just giving them the tools to to kind of kickstart a career in entertainment if they wanted to do that after university. Um, so yeah, that's that's what Nell and I worked on the past few years. I I was the the president there for a bit and also managed a couple artists. And Nell was uh, yeah, I did artist marketing throughout the four years. So got to meet a lot of artists and work with a lot of cool people. But yeah, it's a really great team that, and, and really well supported by the university with, you know, alumni helping out. And it was actually started back in uh, 2006 um, and it's had, you know, a couple big names come through over the years. Mike Posner did some stuff with Small Town back in the day and Delta Ray, some of the members were involved with Small Town. So uh, I think, uh, you know, the goal of the organization, aside from being, you know, a hands-on learning experience for students in the music business, that um, I think it also really could be the the next platform for a college artist to blow up a bit fantastic that you've had that opportunity to uh you know to have those sorts of facilities and and expertise around you um and so so nell you've come at it from a marketing point of view were you studying marketing yeah well i've always been kind of from starting college kind of gone on the marketing path um but i got involved in small town my freshman year my friend was like oh i'm going to a meeting and i thought i love music that sounds cool so i went to that but then Kind of throughout my college career, I was doing different internships in marketing, taking a lot of marketing classes. They weren't really with music. Um, But then I guess going into my senior year, I kind of realized if you're marketing something, you have to be super passionate about it. And music was something that I loved working with the artists. I I loved representing music from the marketing standpoint. So that's kind of when I decided 
maybe this could be an actual career um, and I should look into this a little more. And, and collectively, you guys are a rider management. So, I mean, so from marketing into to management now, I mean, you know, was that sort of always in your line of sight or was it just something that's kind of happened along the way? Yeah, well, I think what's really cool is that, especially now with streaming, um, artists can be super independent and release a lot of music independently. And one thing, though, that you don't get when you're releasing with a record label, when you're releasing independently, not with a record label, is that kind of marketing help. So what Ethan and I do is he'll handle a lot of the day-to-day um, management stuff, and then I kind of come in and help with the, a lot of the marketing things that if some of our artists are releasing not with a record label, um, it's definitely helpful. And even when we're releasing with smaller record labels, definitely the extra extra marketing help push it up. Extra marketing push helps it a lot and kind of just like advising them on social media and stuff like that. Ethan, you entered it more from the manager side and the A&R side, but you have added that sort of marketing component to your to your experience. So as a sort of, I suppose, a, a young executive, you know, how important do you think it is having that sort of broad s- skill set? Yeah, I think that was kind of everything for me, as I, especially just not only, you know, having the skill sets that I have today, but also kind of figuring out what I wanted to do with my career um, like Nell, I, you know, throughout my time when I was in university, um, had, you know, a couple s- internship experiences over the summers in addition to running that, that label small town records when I was at school. Um, but I, you know, I, I had everything. I, I worked in events at billboard for a bit. I did some A&R at Republic records. I did some, some marketing work with some companies called crush and M theory. So for me, it was really about trying different things and figuring out what I loved um, and, you know, as long as I was working in music, I was happy and, and really felt satisfied. But I think the most fulfilling thing for me was really hands on working with artists um, and being able to dive into so many different sides of the industry through that line of work. Um, so that's kind of ultimately how I came to it. I think I, I liked a little bit of everything and management was the perfect way to to, to get the best of, of all sides of the industry. And, and what was the college degree that you've just done? Is it, is it a sort of postgraduate thing or, you know, what, I have no idea how old you guys are, but you know, it's like. We both just got our, our bachelor's degrees. Um, I actually got mine in psychology, something totally unrelated. For, like both of us, I don't think we knew we wanted to go into working with artists per se when we came into school at, at 18 years old. So um, I think it was kind of about finding the best way to teach ourselves along the way that kind of allowed us to you know, pursue our, our academic career uh, while we were in school, but also uh, really find a way to start working with artists on the side too. And, and now what was the degree that you did? I studied economics, which we'll see how it, how it helps in the real world, world. But actually I, for my senior thesis, wrote about the um, economics of music streaming. So that was pretty cool. I got to kind of combine the two things, well, what I was studying academically with what I was passionate about and wanted to continue to do. So that was pretty cool. Were you looking at it from the point of view of how, how the world has changed? I'm, I'm curious about this this thesis. Yeah, so I was looking at um, the willingness to pay, consumer willingness to pay for a subscription, um, kind of on the idea that it's become so personalized with the algorithm, with saving music. I kind of had this idea that in economics, we call it a specific asset and that these streaming platforms are um, specific assets in the sense that after a person invests a lot of time and effort into the platform, they're not gonna wanna switch. Um, And the idea of behind that, like why I was so interested in that is then maybe we could argue that these platforms could raise the price or at least like price tier based on how long someone's been on the platform Um, and I think all artists would like that. I think the whole music industry would like that because we'd all be getting a little bit more money um, and people could start making more money for their streams and everything. So that's kind of the whole idea behind it. And actually, I did some, to find the willingness to pay, I found that through a lot of like economic um, strategies, I found that based on a survey, I think I got 500 responses. Um, People were willing to pay at like fourteen ninety or something. I think I got, um, which is interesting because people are usually paying nine ninety nine. So if we have those five, about five extra dollars, we could really do something. And and did, did did you sort of learn why they might want to pay a little bit more? Was it additional services, better quality, that type of thing? Or um, yeah, so it was based on the. So I looked at it based on the features. 
So the most important features were the algorithm, um, the ability to save music and playlisting. Surprisingly, the social feature by like following people or being able to see other people's playlists wasn't as important, but based on those, I was able to find kind of what people were able, like willing to pay for those specific features um, and then ov for the overall platform and subscription. Well, I hope uh, the guys at Spotify are listening <laughs> could definitely use your help in raising their ARPU and the industry would thank you for it. Um, I recently interviewed the CEO of a, a company in the UK called Cartel Music Group and he started his kind of business from the management point of view. So he first of all had a management company and he, what he's done is he's now turned it into what we're going to call it artist services, label services. So it has a sort of baseline of, of distribution, both physical and digital, and then kind of in and around that and indeed, you know, something that can be separated from that is kind of all these uh, other services. So he has on staff, in-house, you know, PR and plugging and all the rest of it. And do, I mean, your company, it's obviously just sort of in the early sort of genesis. Yeah, presumably at the moment when you've got an artist you're having to kind of go away and pick your team you're going to have to go away and find distribution you have to go and like you know decide whether or not you want to bring in outside marketing expertise i know obviously you're doing some of that in in-house yourself i mean sort of you know do you, how, how do you find that experience and where do you see the company kind of headed to in that in that in that sort of vein of potentially pivoting yeah, I think for right now, um, our goal is really just focused on our, our, our clients that we have signed with us on, in a management capacity and, and doing whatever we can to help these independent artists kind of take the jump to the next stage in their career. Um, we are doing a bit of con like con artist development, streaming promo, whatever you want to call it, uh, consulting type work as well. Um, but yeah, I really, you know, I, I do see a lot of potential opportunities to provide more services to artists if, you know, ultimately we end up having distribution partnerships or, you know, more label services type uh, of a deal. But I think for now, with just the two of us kind of focusing on, you know, management and then marketing and PR, I think we've got a bit of our hands full with, uh, with, with the, the clients we have at the moment. So yeah, really just focusing on management for now. And, and I think uh, doors will open as we, as we continue to build and grow and do other things in the industry. And so, so now, uh, where, where are the artists signed at the moment? Is it to a variety of different record labels or have you got kind of a couple that you typically work with or did you set up your own label? How's it working? Yeah, so we're mostly, um, instead of, like we don't have the artists signed to a label, but a lot of times with the releases, we'll get, we'll try to get some of the songs signed with um, different labels and some people have come to us interested in signing certain songs. Um, but we've also done a, a lot of releases independently. So it all kind of just depends what we think would work best for that release, what kind of support we want with that release. Um, but yeah, as of now, we kind of pick and choose with all each release song. Yeah, so right now we're working with uh, we're working with two dance artists and one kind of I guess you could call it emo pop artist. Mm -hmm. um, and the dance artists tend to be doing more releases through. Uh, like single releases through independent dance labels um, and our pop guy just we've been doing stuff independently for now it's interesting to me because you know the sort of the old world model is an artist goes to a record company and signs a three album deal and they kind of end up staying there for years whereas you, you guys are, are just really coming at this and just going right what is the individual project and what is the best opportunity for that project how's that going to best live and breathe in terms of like all of the things that you know that you need kind of outside of the services that that you guys can provide directly yourselves i mean how, how do you find that that process of finding the best partners whether that's a distribution company or whether that's you know how do you advance the money in order to pay for all these services you know wh where does that come from does that come from a distribution deal or or are you relying on these, uh, you know, independent labels to, you know, kind of provide some of that financing to get the record off the ground? Yeah, for sure. It, it really depends, I think, project to project. But um, for the ones that are signed for independent single deals um, with independent labels, those tend to be a little bit less of a resource burden on us naturally to, you know, everything from putting things through distribution and, and having that relationship and network set up versus like, putting together content and assets and all that stuff. Um, when we're doing stuff independently, everything is funded through, you know, obviously the artist's revenue um, from, you know, previous releases and, and work and that sort of thing. Um, I think we, we, we tend to try to keep things pretty low budget and we're pretty good about it with, you know, 
rotor being one of the great tools that we're now using to do so. <laughs> love, love that plug. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, no, and uh, yeah, because you guys, uh, with one of your artists, Mars, you know, have created an amazing lyrics video. Might add for $25, uh, if you're <laughs> needing lyrics videos, you can head to uh, rotorvideos.com. Uh, but it was, it was great. And I shared that with a bunch of people and, uh, you know, in the industry, both at Rotor and outside, and they, and they were blown away by it. I mean, it was, you know, it was something really simple, but really effective and a great use of, of the Rotor at all so i appreciate you giving me a fantastic sort of showcase yeah <laughs> no of course business. we're Thank loving it and sharing it i think we'll be uh we'll be using it quite a bit more in the near future too so and so i guess in a similar vein, i mean have you uh, have you also found some of those kind of online diy distribution services useful because th these days they do much more than just kind of sending the stuff through to, to apple and spotify that you know they have kind of inbuilt you can add a bit of marketing you can add a bit of publishing neighboring rights whatever and i guess as managers you're always having to think more holistically about how you put that that artist and record into the market. I mean, have, have you used some of those tools? Yeah, absolutely. We um, well, when we were when we were doing the small town record stuff, the label um, just did like all of their stuff was through DistroKid, um, which was great. But we've had artists work with CD Baby, TuneCore. We're doing some stuff with United Masters now. I think really what's been the the biggest uh, step in the right direction for us in terms of using those partners is is obviously you know. Those, those partners have a lot, those distribution services have a lot of clients um, because they're pretty, there's not a huge barrier to entry, right? They're pretty cheap. Some of them are even f you know, free to upload and they'll take a cut, whatever it might be. Um, but I think the best move that we made on that front was getting connected with um, some employees on the priority artist teams there and just making sure that you know, when our stuff is going through that we, you know, Every, all the metadata is correct. We, we don't run into any release issues, which is you know kind of half the battle when you're dealing with distribution. Um, so I, I, I think just kind of leveraging our personal network from you know whether that be internship experiences or whatever it might be to kind of establish those relationships and partnerships for our artists has been pretty instrumental in the last few months of just making sure things are running smoothly on our end. So have you found it easier to work with online services or do you prefer to work with kind of more established labels? Or, you know, what is your preference from an experience point of view? I personally really like to do releases independently. I don't think that you need to have the biggest, most well-resourced team to, to do things the right way. Um, I, I look at a lot of young artists now that are making waves that are have no one around them um, and are just doing all the right things on the marketing front. So I, I really, I, I kind of like doing things independently. I like to have a little bit more oversight and control um, over what's going on. I think, yeah, I guess you could definitely. call it micromanaging, but it's really just, I think, making sure things are done the way that we want them to be done um, rather than going through other folks where, you know, you're not getting your release assets until a couple days before, or, you know, whatever it might be. There's always, it's hard to be the priority when you're a young developing artist in a bigger system, you know? Ethan can tell you I'm very organized and I like everything laid out. So when we have a release with another label and we don't get the assets until like three days before, it's very frustrating. And I keep emailing them, keep hitting them up, but it's nice to kind of have your own schedule and like know when you'll have everything by. And, and uh, in, in terms of, I'm now just generally curious, in terms of like when you're planning out a campaign, I mean, what, what sort of time scales are you looking at? Because I know that there's been a real tendency, uh, you know, in recent years where, you know, technology has essentially made it very, very easy just to put a record out. Given that you are sort of new into this industry, apologies for saying it quite like that, but you understand my point. Do, do you, Are you looking at long term release schedules or or is it kind of it's all about sort of the immediacy? It's about sort of picking up on something, you know, as it's happening right there and then. Yeah, I think again, it really depends project to project too. We have um, we have one artist we're working with right now who has a huge catalog of you know like thirty and plus some odd songs that they've are ready to release, but aren't you know don't just want to put out willy nilly. They want to make sure everything is you know placed with they they want to do things through independent dance labels and want to make sure that everything is placed you know uh, with the right teams around them and all that. So for stuff like that, I think we're a lot a little bit more. Um, deliberate and kind of release things as opportunities come about. But for some of our other folks, I mean, we're looking three, four, five months out because we're talking about singles leading up to EPs and albums and whatever. So um, I think it really depends case to case. But for the most part, I think Nell and I always would prefer to be uh, have a have a several month window rather than an artist coming to us saying, I want to put this out in three weeks. <laughs> 
which we do get sometimes. But yeah. Yes, from a distribution point of view, uh, we're the last people to ever find out about this, uh, and then it's like the day before. Like, can we put this live? No, that's not how it works. <laughs> well, in fact, you can, but no one's going to know it's there. You know, it's, it's a very interesting conversation that we have on a regular basis. In terms of campaign planning, I mean, how how is the the lockdown situation that we briefly touched upon at the beginning? How how's that affected you know your any of your current projects rollout strategies? I mean, obviously, live has been a bit of a challenge, being that you can't can't do it um anything else like that that you kind of try to had to now had to find sort of other ways of you know promoting it in, in a different way i think live was is really the only big thing that's impacted us yeah. um some you know all of our artists really we were trying to have kind of build up a, a a local presence in their city but also travel a bit and do stuff so that was it was definitely kind of a i wouldn't say you know the focus of what we do but it was a it was a big component of how we grew our artists um, but in terms of, of how we operate now, I think Nell and I kind of always have uh, functioned in a very strong digital promo role for our artists, and that's all the more important now than ever. So uh, I, I, think, uh, I think we're doing everything pretty much the same. Yeah. Yeah, it's allowing us to kind of set up, hopefully, when live music comes back, to have the digital online community there. Um, and then hopefully live will come back sooner than later. But you've both come into the industry at a point where technology has dramatically changed how the artist communicates with the audience um, and as a consequence m many of the traditional gatekeepers of radio PR physical retail distribution that they've all changed or so, certainly in terms of their necessity have you have you been aware of of that or or you know has it been helpful or a bit of a hindrance now that there's sort of a you know a greater level of noise sort of out there because basically anyone can put a record live I mean it how, how do you, have you noticed that? I guess you've got, probably got no comparison to it, but how do you feel about that? Yeah, we definitely don't have that much of a basis of comparison because I think everything Nell and I have been doing has been, you know, we were already in the streaming era. But um, I, I I don't think it's, a, I, I don't view it as a problem. I mean, obviously there's a lot of, a, a ton of music being released every single day. Um, I don't think that every artist necessarily has, you know, a strong team around them and is doing the right things. But I think the beautiful thing about, kind of this dynamic is at least every artist has the opportunity, right? Um, so I think, you know, if any artist does their reading and they do their research and they, they learn some best practices of how they should be putting stuff out, I think it's uh, at least now all the more level of playing field than ever, which is great. Yeah, I was saying this to Ethan the other day, but like, especially with promo, I think we've noticed change, especially in the past few months. Like, I remember, I think in January, February, we were thinking of starting to do promo on TikTok for some of our artists. And I made an account and I was like, Ethan, I feel so weird. It's all teenagers on here, like dancing. I don't really want to be messaging these like 14 year olds to look at, like listen to the music. Um, but now it's completely different. Everyone has a TikTok. People are getting huge on TikTok. So in that sense, the promo sense, I definitely think we've seen some change and recognized it. Well, it's, uh, you mentioned United Masters earlier and they've obviously just announced that they, they now provide distribution through to TikTok users i mean god knows how that's all going to pan out but um is that is that something that, like, like when you see these new services come along do you just, just generally speaking take the approach of give it a go see how, see how we do like see if it makes any difference i think for us it's uh it's kind of always been just chatting with someone on the team there and really seeing what uh, it depends what our needs are you know one of the with regard to united masters specifically you know now with that TikTok deal that obviously adds a great deal of appeal, but they have some some great partnerships um, with the NBA and some Apple Music play like they, some Apple Music playlists and other things like that that you know they kind of throw in to build this uh, sweeter package for <laughs> for an independent artist coming in. Um, but yeah, I think it. I don't think there was anything in particular. I think it's really just feeling uh, feeling out what sort of team on the, on the distribution end we wanted around us. Um, but we've we've had really good experiences working with quite a few companies across the board it really um, our artists just tend to have different preferences on that front oh, okay so uh, so you are you finding that some of your decisions are kind of coming almost pre-packaged as the artists come into your orbit that they're coming with a, a team of people that they've either worked before or a company that they've worked with before perhaps that's where the catalog is i mean are you finding that some of those decisions are made before you can kind of really impact it or I think uh, we're seeing that a little bit more for one of the artists that we started working with recently just because he was already a bit established. He had just came out of a deal with um, a manager from Rock Nation 
Um, so he kind of already had some of the, you know, the, the foundational stuff in place. He wasn't like a, a bare bones, you know, <laughs> independent artist that we were building up from ground zero. He definitely already had an audience and a fan base and we were kind of jumping on and seeing how we can help out further. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, and I don't view that as a challenge per se. I think it's, it's great. It's, it's, if anything, it allows us to kind of try out some more networks and platforms and, and see what we like too. And just sort of going back to uh, something, uh, Nell, you talked about earlier with TikTok, and you were talking about, you know, the idea of messaging, you know, users on the platform, presumably influencers on the platform, you know, people that you thought, you know, might uh, be able to help promote, you know, whatever it is that you're that you're doing. How, how have you sort of generally speaking ap- approach that? Because there's all sorts of like theories and thoughts around sort of more traditional streaming services like Spotify and how to affect the algorithms through feeder playlists and, and all the rest of it. I mean, is, is that something you've kind of really dialed into uh, or, or, is you, or are you just sort of guessing? I mean, what, what's going on in your head? Yeah. I mean, right now, most of kind of our outreach, is, because they're smaller artists, most of our outreach is trying to contact different editorials or different um, Spotify curate, playlist curators um, and now getting kind of into the influencer realm. But, I mean, there are tools that help. Like, we use Chartmetric a lot, which is very helpful kind of to just see who these curators are. Um, it definitely changes, I think, now that people know that there's a market to putting music in the playlist. A lot of people start charging pretty crazy prices, and we stay away from those for the most part. But it is kind of just like making connections with people. Then you have your contacts who want to hear your new music, um, who run some of these playlists. So I think there is a lot of constant outreach, and we're doing that a lot. Um, but hopefully, as we keep doing it, we'll kind of have these contacts that like our, like like the artist's music um, and kind of want to work with us. So that's kind of the goal. But yeah, there is a lot of outreach, kind of emailing people, um, messaging them on their socials. But it's been helpful for growing. It definitely helps the algorithm um, and just growing their streaming base. And then, of course, the flip side of that, too, is all of the advising of, you know, now I think especially more than ever, like fans are looking at artists on social media and saying, you know, is this an experience that I want to continue to follow and engage with, right? So just making sure our artists are always having super engaging content and are being consistent um, and communicating with their with their audience. I think that's kind of the, the other flip side. You could do the digital promo, but the artist has to be there for people to see, right? So um, that's those are kind of the two sides of what we tend to, I think, focus on day to day as we're advising our clients. Uh, it's interesting to hear how you're sort of thinking about uh, building up your own sort of database of engaged influencers and just generally the audience long has been the held wisdom that an email mailing list is still by far the best way of contacting people i know that upsets people like mark zuckerberg massively but still true to this day i've lived through this evolution and i remember this moment where independent playlists were being created to the point where you could then contact somebody say can i send you my new record great and then they would put it in and it would have a meaningful impact on your on your revenue and so that then became a sort of gold you know one of the many gold rushes that we've we've had in this industry of late of trying to sort of harness these kind of movements and and changes and of course tiktok is uh the uh the 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 current one uh that we're all still trying to figure out but yeah chart metric uh good shout out on that by the way and i had Chaz jenkins from uh from chart metric metric on the show good friend of mine very very smart guy um and just sort of you know just helping me over the years you know understand how those algorithms work within those platforms and and how you can affect them and it is a whole a whole new world uh, so i was just yeah as i said i was kind of curious as to kind of how you'd sort of looked at that from your different perspective should we call it rather than my slightly jaded one yeah i think that i think that the other thing that would be important to note too is like everything that we do is super data driven. Um, we're not really making any calls that are like a shot in the dark. We're always looking at past performance of you know whatever it might be that we're <laughs> trying to lock in for our artists. But uh, we try to make very informed decisions based on data and, and seeing you know because you can you can literally see the spikes in impact, right? So playing off that um, as we move forward is, is kind of everything. So are you doing some sort of A-B testing on things? Like you're sort of trying something out, does it work, no, pull back, do something else? We're doing a little bit of that now with like um, with like ad campaigns, like Instagram and Facebook ads and Google ads and YouTube and that sort of thing. We're diving into that a bit, but um, 
I think for, I wouldn't say we're doing any sort of like A-B testing for other outreach. I think um, we just kind of have goals in mind of like what we're willing to commission for certain reach. Um, and then we just, we, we kind of play, play it from there. Um, and where, where, what are the sort of the, the analytics platforms that you're finding most useful? Is it is it the chart metrics, which are obviously it's more, it's public data, right? It's not it's not the sort of proprietary data that you might get from your, your distribution company, but it is ultimately very different and more varied often. I mean, where, where, where are the best sort of sources of information that you're, you're, where do you spend your time each day? Yeah, I think uh, it's everything from like your Spotify for artists and Apple for artists backends to looking at your Shazam numbers each week when you have a release to looking at chart metric and, and public data like that. I think it's really everything we try to tap into. Yeah, we also try to keep track week by week kind of, of how our numbers are growing um, when we have new releases and Sometimes we'll see weird spikes and we're like, where did that come from? Like one track had all these Shazams and we couldn't figure out like who was Shazamming it and why there were hundreds more than other songs. But sometimes those are left a mystery. Like we could not figure that one out. But it's a lot of just looking at the numbers and then trying to see, oh, did we do an ad in a certain place? So we kind of are combining all of the analytics on the platforms that they give us. Yeah, I, uh, some of those things can be very, very weird. I mean, I, I think like, I seem to remember one that we I was working on with an artist, and and what it, and all it was in terms of Shazam spikes was that um, one of the the big retail brands had put the record in the playlist within the shops and so it just for that whatever that period of time that was suddenly the shazams shazams went off the off the chart it was great i mean you know you can't really you can't necessarily you know predict that stuff or you can't necessarily use that again or whatever but it, it is fascinating but also what's interesting to me is that um you know being somebody who's sort of come for, come at this industry from a uh, technology point of view as much as a, a music industry point of view and i've built many a dashboard uh that, that sort of aggregates lots of data over over the years um the fact is that your your response to my question was we look at a whole load of them uh which you know is just a worry uh that nobody has figured out how to kind of like pull that stuff into one because uh, it would be much better if you could uh, co- you know compare it all but um uh, it, interesting nonetheless I, I suppose the last question have you relied upon any sort of like mentors to uh, help advise you as you've sort of gone through this this early part of your career or I mean, because your knowledge base by the way is excellent like you are you know ticking all the boxes in terms of like a much more experienced set of people to you know have an understanding of the industry so I'm just curious as to sort of how you've got there so quickly yeah I, I appreciate you saying that um, I, I think uh, for a lot of us like and when I say a lot of us kids that, you know, were coming out of a university and, and trying to kind of learn along the way, having someone in a mentorship role can be pretty instrumental. And it certainly was for me. Um, the whole reason I got into music to begin with was a, a family friend of mine who lives in my, my neighborhood. I, he moved in. I, I put a, a letter in his mailbox and he happened to be a pretty big executive at Billboard. And uh, kind of opened up doors for me there, leveraged some folks there to kind of help me get other stuff at Republic and other places. So I think kind of those people that are willing to take a shot on you uh, are the ones that are kind of also willing to help see you through your career a little bit. But I, I've had other folks too, like even old, um, like people that that were formerly my boss uh, are now, you know, kind of colleagues of mine in a consulting capacity and, and just folks like that that are really, you know, kind of providing opportunities for not only us to add value, but to learn a lot too. Um, so yeah, definitely had, have had my, my share of those, but I'll let Nell yeah. speak on her end. Similar to Ethan, like my boss that I still kind of work with now has just been a huge help. Um, and he's been in the industry for 25 years. So he knows a lot about what he says is he knows a lot about what not to do. So that's been helpful, just getting advice from him. And then where we went to, to university there's it's a very small um group of people i guess who actually end up going into entertainment and specifically music so i find that a lot i've just been reaching out to a lot of them kind of just talking to them and everyone has been so willing to help um they give me advice they keep up with what i'm doing and so i think that's been really helpful and now i can see the community is definitely growing um at our school so that's really cool to see and yeah, so definitely a lot of alum um, and like my past internship. 
Yeah, I think that's the advice to anyone ever in an internship role too, right? Is uh, don't half-ass your work because you never know who's going to be able to help you out later on down the road. Oh, absolutely. Thank you very much for, for taking the time to, to talk to me and, and sharing your experiences and knowledge. It's been really, really interesting. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, thanks again for having us. This has been this has been great. It was it was great to get connected initially with Rotor, and it's great to be kind of uh, be able to have a, have a larger conversation too. So this is awesome. More videos to come, for sure. So I'm going to send this to the CEO of Rotor. <laughs> He's probably going to offer you both a job um, <laughs> and get rid of me. Um, <laughs> good. Okay, well, thank you again. Um, so uh, so to my listeners, thank you for listening. Uh, stay in touch with the show via my socials. I am at Alex Branson on both Twitter and Instagram. Uh, also, a shout out to the incredible audio assassins who have provided the music branding for the show. A link in the show notes. And I'm also going to put some links to some of the artists that, that ride a management manage uh, so uh, go and check out some of the incredible artists that they've got there as well 